Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, let's start. I guess, I guess we start with the theme. Yes. See if this brings back memory. Uh, it's right at the beginning. I think it's right at the, the right at the beginning. Some of you are right at the beginning. Too young to have seen it unless you tune into YouTube. But some of them who are a little bit older, but not as old as us, will perhaps remember. <laughs> Lots of uh, introductions over the time we were on air, and that was that was one of them, perhaps the one most people remember. But we were on air as Curiosity Show for those who didn't see us from 1972 to 1990. It went to uh, it was a national program, and it went uh, to I think about 15 countries, and then onto cable. And now we've put it onto YouTube. So uh, if you like this sort of making and doing stuff, you can get into Curiosity Show on YouTube. And we've broken that into segments, including a making and doing segment for those who are interested. But um, it was, uh, they reckon the golden years of television in Australia were the 70s and the 80s. We were just lucky enough to hit that. So we went right through those two decades. And the program was really all about making and doing and science and technology and uh, trying to keep alive what we both had in a pre-television era, the, the joy of making things, making things that worked, using your fingers to make and repair and and do all that. So that was a very strong element of the program. And we're going to do a little bit of that with you today. So um, I think without much uh, more ado, let's, um, if you want to look us up, we're on YouTube, as I say, but Dean, over to you. Yeah, some people used to, used to say to us, how does the Curiosity Show differ from other programs? And we said, well, three things we try to do all the time. One of them was use everyday materials, things around the home, things like coins, matchsticks, rubber bands, paper clips. Also, we tried to show close-ups as often as we could, get in really close to things, show things larger than life. And thirdly, we tried to control your viewpoint. Sometimes you saw things from the front, sometimes from a high angle, sometimes a low angle, sometimes we invited you around to our side of the table to see things from this point of view. So let's have a look at some examples of using everyday materials and using close-ups. So we'll run a few of these, they might bring back memories, they might give you ideas of things you can try tonight at home. Okay, we'll just roll the tape and here are some everyday materials, close-ups. 22, we're up to. 23, 24, 24. 24. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Try and balance it on your wrist. You normally we feel the pulse, but maybe we'll be able to see it. There it is, rocking. You see it? Shoots off very quickly. It can fill its body with water and squirt it out the back end. Switch it on again, pick it up, move it across, drop. You see, just on the end there, there's a little hard lump. They can knock against the bone for each other. There we go, like that. And so here's the last part. Up off the table, there we are. 13 matchsticks, all held up by just one. Try it on your friends. I've got two. Leave it we matches with square rigged sails on them. Put one in there and one in there, much like the boat that you saw, and that is now set to sail the world. If we put it into the ocean here and we blow a wind on it, I'm going to use a straw so you can see the direction that the wind is coming from. In this case, it's behind the boat, which scoots off very effectively indeed. Just pause it there. So in every case you were seeing things larger than light and they were everyday materials that you're familiar with. And also some examples now of controlling your viewpoint, making sure that you saw things from the ideal position. There might be a million people watching, but we gave them all the best spot, front row and centre. Here are some examples of controlling your viewpoint. Control the tape. What happens if I place a candle underneath this little strip that's sitting there all by itself? 
So you see the bar and light happen and then see if you're right. Here comes the flame underneath. Watch it carefully. You can see what it's doing. The end of it is bending up. It's bending up because the aluminium, which is on the bottom, expands more than copper. What happens if you provide the brain with both those clues together? Well, have another look at the cards. What's going on there? It looks like a small fire stuck on a large knife. This is how the trick's done. Well, as you can see, it's cunningly arranged. This is what we've done, and you can do it at home if you have an old pack of cards. How does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. We just happen to have a model of that temple right here. We put it underneath the altar, and slowly but surely, intriguing things happen. And the door opens. How did that work? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you come around behind me, and maybe you can figure it out for yourself. Uh, because behind the cardboard box, oh, there you are. <laughs> we just pause it there for a moment. Now, Rob mentioned that the show went to 15 other countries besides Australia. Most of those were English-speaking countries. There was, uh, there was New Zealand, uh, the UK, uh, many other places as well, but some of them were places where they spoke another language, including Germany. They wanted more than 100 of our programs translated into German. Now, they had a problem when they translated it into German because the words in German tend to be long words and so everything came out about 15% longer than the paragraphs in English. So they had to cut it down, edit it, and then re-insert re uh, the voices from two actors who could speak English and German. Rob and I can't speak any German. And their actors would then try and lip-sync our movements of lips with their spoken words in German. Strange effect, but this is how it looked. This is the, one of the German versions of the Curiosity Show that was seen by girls and boys throughout Europe. Same title, they let, let that in English. Hallo und willkommen zur Curiosity Show. Wir haben schon oft von Seemannsknoten gesprochen, aber wisst ihr auch, was das ist? Bestimmt wisst ihr das. Aber falls manche von euch nicht wissen, wie man einen knüpft, dann zeige ich es euch. Die Aufsatz benutzen. Nehmen wir mal an, ich wollte meine Wange massieren. Ich äh, müsste nur das Gerät nehmen, mir so an die Wange setzen und anfangen, die Kurbel zu drehen. Und abgesehen davon, dass das Sprechen irgendwie schwer fällt und dass man alles doppelt sieht, wäre es eine Massage oder sowas. So that's how I saw it in Germany. Just pause it there for a moment. So, uh, Germany is still a popular... Uh, group of people watching the Curiosity Show on YouTube. In fact, uh, YouTube, of course, goes all around the world. Our biggest audience is in America. Second biggest audience is in Germany. Australia comes fourth or fifth because of their population sizes. They have more people watching it. So we are building audiences all around the world still with Curiosity Show. Rob. Well, thanks, Dean. Dean talked about some of those techniques we use. And they were pretty commonplace now when you, when you look at television, but they weren't then. We started in the black and white days, and in those days, television was largely filmed in a theatre like this with a cable, and you stood behind it like a lecturer in a, in a theatre. So uh, we are credited in, in uh, WikiLeaks, I see, with the phrase, here's one I prepared earlier, because we never showed anything that you could make without showing at the end how well ours worked. A lot of kids will make something, and they think they can make a, an aeroplane powered by a rubber band and fly around for hours. It doesn't. Ours never could. So if you show that it does work, but how well you can make it work, at least they know if theirs isn't working, that there's something they, they can do. And I, I grew up with books that said, here's a plane you can make out of uh, matchboxes and it will fly. And mine hunted into the ground like a stone. And I always thought it was me. And no, no, it was done by some sort of drunk on Friday afternoon. The thing would never have flown. But I thought it was me. And that's a bad thing to give children something to make that cannot work. So we always showed that ours could work, even if they didn't work for very long. And we're going to show you some of these things today. We haven't got long, so we can't show you how to make all of them. We'll show you how to make some of them. But we talk about making things out of everyday materials. I love music. I play music. I play trumpet in, uh, in a jazz band. But I reckon you can make a lot of really nice instruments out of leftover bits of plumbing. So I'm going to show you a range of PVC instruments, all of which you can make yourself and play yourself. Dean, can you give us a hand with the microphone if you would? Oh, okay. PVC, just plumber's offcuts are wonderful. I mean, you, you can drill them and put a, a whistle in there, and you can actually make a playable recorder. 
his illustration from 1796, just the thing you've seen there. He had a bit of bow. And that's, that's it. That's just landed. But you can see how it worked when it was in its heyday and the Beatles hadn't chewed the feathers away. Well, I'll show you in film how it worked because it's too hard to make it fly really. There it is, just a repetition. 
but you, it's got a bow there, and as you wound that spindle, you tightened the string on the bow, and the bow gave the propulsive effect. And you see those rotors now, they're going to go in opposite directions, but each one will push the air down. So when you let it go, it went like that. And it didn't fly for very long, and we're going to see it in slow motion. But if you look in slow motion, you can see the rotors going in opposite directions, and each one doing its little bit to propel it into the air. And that was the first self-propelled flying machine ever made. And that's all it was, but it was a milestone in the, in the history of flight. Well, people reckon if you want to make money, develop a better mousetrap. I reckon you develop better uses for mousetraps. And this is the mousetrap racer. Here's the original here, but you'll see it better up on the screen. Now, if you want to make one of these, we'll run through it very quickly. You get a mousetrap. There it is, that's the finished article, remember that. You get a mousetrap and you put screw eyes at the back and you put screw eyes under the front and you line them up because they're just the right size for an axle made out of dowel. I make my wheels with a, with a hole saw and belt the axle into them. You see how it just goes through those eyes and you can tap the wheel on the other side. A bit of thread from the bar just back to the back axle. You can drill a hole in that if you like or use a bit of blue tack as I've done there. You don't want it any longer because it can trap the thing and put the brakes on. You see when you fire it, the, it pulls on the axle, unwinds it, and... Well, yes, I added the sound effects, but in slow effect, what's the bar coming over? And you see how it pulls it and uh, makes it fire. Well, that's the racer, and it had a, a wide axle, but I developed that into the mousetrap paddle wheeler. There again is the original from the show. Have a look at it there, you can see the idea. In this case, you, you cut a boat shape bit of wood and you put the screw eyes at the, uh, at the back along that line and you nail the mousetrap on in front of them. Make sure the wood's big enough to float. Now, people moan about the loss of wooden cotton reels and the loss of a craft, but plastic cotton reels have got their, their uh, assets too. They have marvellous little precision turbines. And if you split between those radiating spokes, and I use veins made out of an ice cream container because they're waterproof. Slide them in there and the tension will hold them. And that's a nice little paddle wheel. Put a bit of plasticine in the middle, you poke it in, and that means you can embed a chaslic skewer as a thin axle, put it through, and put the other one on the other side. Now the thin axle will give you endurance rather than speed. Once again, our thread goes onto the axle. You can tie it on in this case because you don't worry about the... Uh, uh, putting on the brakes, and that's what happens when you let the one go. And on the surface of, the surface of water, put it on there and fire it, and it's got enough prod, if you make it well, probably just to get across the swimming pool. So you make one of those too. But I wasn't finished with that. I had dogs that were getting into my garden and causing a lot of damage. Now how do you stop them? With the Morrisonian mouse trap garden protector. This time, you take a mouse trap and you drill a hole in the back underneath the bait trap. You then nail it onto a stake which also has a hole. You see the hole goes all the way through and you tap it on. Then you get the old string and you make a little loop. This time you put it through that hole so it's onto the bait trap like that and you're going to fire the thing from behind and you're probably beginning to get the idea. Now, you've got to have something that makes it a bit frightening, so a party holds the next thing. And if you pull that apart, you find the thing that goes bang is just a little explosive on the, on the string. I use foil because it makes it waterproof and it gives me something to attach it with. So you cut it off there, don't cut through it, it'll go bang in your face. You wrap it up in foil and as you wrap it, you leave a little tail. And that goes around the nail that you put in above the mousetrap because these things will fire if you pull the string or you hit them. You see how the bar is going to come down? Now what you have to do is to nail it in around the thing you want to protect. You put little black strings there that the dogs won't see. You set each one and let the dogs go. <laughs> and they never went near my garden again. Try it yourself. Take Problem, tell you some of the answer, but leave it for you to work out the rest yourself. 
So here's an example of one called the Curiosity Wheel. It's a device that does strange things, but we ask you to try and jump ahead and work out what's going to happen before you're told. Let's have a look at the Curiosity Wheel. You are about to see the launching of the Curiosity Wheel. What is it and what does it do? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. Looks like an ordinary tin can with a piece of cardboard on each end, but it behaves in a very peculiar way. We send it off across the floor, and at the appropriate moment, I will flick my fingers, and it comes back. Not only does it come back, but it keeps going. All the way back there, until I flick my fingers again, and it comes home. What on earth is happening here? It must have something curious inside it, and it does. Because wherever I send it, it seems to come back home. I tell you what, I'll explain to you what things it has inside it and then see if you can figure out what's going on. It has inside it a large rubber band and a blob of plasticine or modelling clay and two ice cream sticks. The way in which those bits and pieces are organised or put together is of course absolutely vital. What do you know about rubber bands? You know that when you stretch them, they unstretch. When you twist them, they untwist. Which of those two do you think is the important thing for this little motor? Well, it's the twisting one. The piece of plasticine acts as a sort of a weight around the rubber band so that it holds it in place. And when the rubber band tends to twist, it stays there for a while. Any clearer? Tell you what, we need to go back to scratch and build a curiosity wheel. Start with a large tin can with a tin lid and carefully make a hole in the centre of the lid and also in the centre of the base. Take the lid off and then bring in your large rubber band. This is the, really the motor of the whole device. Make a groove in the plasticine with your finger. There we are, like that. And that's going to wrap around the rubber band. Another slightly awkward part, but you can do it if you're careful. Try and place it in about the centre of the tin, wrap your fingers around the plasticine, and then it hangs as a weight from the rubber band. So the centre of the rubber band will stay put when the edges twist. So you can now close the whole thing up, you're ready to try it. yourself and have a lot of fun with. Now something else that we made back in those days, the young people tried making for themselves at home, was something called the Ames window. Now you notice that that window is rather unusual. Instead of being rectangular, which most windows are, it's higher on one side than the other. That shape is called a trapezoid. Now you notice that my Ames window, trapezoid window, is sticking out of Harry Potter's head. Now, Harry Potter here is one of those little lollipop holders with an electric motor inside. So when I press the button, the window should go around. But before it does, please cover one eye with one hand. And just stare with your other eye at the window as it rotates. Before long, something strange will happen in your minds. How many can see the window going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards? Take your hand out from your eye. It's been going in a circle the whole time. The only place it went backwards and forwards was inside your brain. It's an optical illusion invented by a man called Professor Ames, that's why we call it the Ames window. And he said this, we've all seen so many windows in our lifetime, they're nearly all square or rectangular. When you see one that isn't like my trape trapezium window, the high side is sometimes closer to you, but sometimes it's away from you. But your memory says, if it's high, it must be towards you. So even when it goes back like this, your brain thinks it's come back this way towards you. That's why it works. And that little device proved so popular that we decided to make a simpler version that everyone can make at home without even using an electric motor. So here's the one that we made a couple of years after showing this one. And see if you can see the effect in your brain. And even though you know how it works, see if the illusion still works in your mind. The strangest window in the entire world. It's called the Ames window. We showed it to you three years ago on an electric motor, spinning around, and it did strange things to your brain because it's an optical illusion. Well, we had so many letters about it that we decided to make another one, this time 
a smaller one that you can make at home. You won't need an electric motor to spin it. You can spin it with a piece of cotton thread. You'll then well, cut it out with a good pair of scissors or one of these safe cutting knives, and you'll end up with a piece of cardboard shaped like that. Now, whichever way you look at that, your brain will tell you that the long end is nearer to you. Now, it is nearer to you now, but now I'll put it back near my body. Now it's nearer to me, but it still looks as if it's near you, doesn't it? Because you're used to seeing things bigger when they are closer to you. Now, here's the spinning motor. It's simply a piece of cotton thread tied to this corner and tied to the other corner. And I've wound it around on my fingers so that when I let it go in a moment, it'll unwind, the thread will unwind, and you'll see the thing spinning. There we are. I'll hold it at the same level as your eyes and we'll let it go. Now you know that it's turning around in circles. In fact, if you look at it from above, you can see that it's turning around in a circle. But now your brain is doing something strange. It's telling you that it's not going around in a circle, but it's oscillating. In other words, it's turning part way, stopping, and then going back the other way. Now that's a strange effect. It's like going to add a ballpoint pen. And to do that, I've placed a little piece of double-sided sticky tape on the ballpoint pen. You can use ordinary sticky tape if you like. I'll place it right through the centre of the window and press it in place like that. But what's your brain going to tell you about the window? Will your brain allow you to see the window going around in a circle Will it, with the pen? Or are you going to see something really strange? <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? You can see the pen going around in a circle. But your brain is telling you that the window is going part way round and turning and going the other way. And yet in order to do that, the two things have to pass through one another, the pen and the window. You know it's not possible, you know it can't happen. And yet as you look at it, you see them going through one another every time they go around. An amazing illusion, the Ames window. And I think you're going to have a lot of fun making your own. segment uh, on the Ames window is on one of our DVDs. It's also on our YouTube channel and it's been seen by more than three quarters of a million people on our YouTube channel. Now, we take motion pictures for granted. We see them at movie theatre, we see them on our television sets, with DVD players, we even see moving pictures on our phones. But there was a time when the only moving pictures you could see we're at the fairground with a machine called a mutograph which had lots of cards that were spinning in a circle. We decided to show you how you can make your own little mutograph moving picture machine. Let's have a look at that. Simple materials from around the home. To make a your own moving picture show. Here's all you'll need. Just one piece of wood, block of wood, large or small. You'll need a cork, which has straight sides, two large safety pins, a paper clip, a straight pin, <laughs> a drawing pin, a little piece of cardboard, and four pieces of white cardboard, all the same size. Oh, you'll also need a safe cutter and some marking pens for doing a little bit of drawing. And here's how you go about it. You start off with the paper clip and you straighten it out. Very easy to bend, aren't they? We've done this many times, I'm sure. Straighten it out like that and straighten it out again until it's almost in a straight line, except for that last little piece. And you're going to use that for a handle. You use it for a handle by bending that part backwards. And you can see now that I can use it as a winder. There we are. That was very easy. Here it is. And I coloured the pictures as well, just for fun. There we are. You can see the four pictures there on the four cards. You can see the little turning device. And now you see why I said you need a straight pin as well. That's so that when I turn that there, the little hill pushes against the straight pin and keeps the cork moving around in a circle smoothly. There's the other piece of cardboard, the thick card. I put that in the front of the block with the drawing pin. Now all I need to do is to push the little cork part through the middle. First of all the handle goes through here and then the other end which was originally straight but you notice I've put a slight kink in it goes around there and there believe it or not is our movie picture device ready to go. Let's watch it now as we check it out. There we go, first picture pink person, yellow head, crouching, second picture starting to leap into the air Third picture, leaping into the air with arms outstretched. Fourth picture, coming down again, back to the first picture, crouching. And if we turn it around, we get the man leaping up and down. Yeah. So that was an old fashioned mutograph. We'll just pause it there for a moment. Now, sometimes we use simple everyday materials to explain quite complex ideas. 
for example, nuclear energy. We decided we could show that, uh, explain how that works using simple materials. Now, I need a helper for this. Uh, I think one of the mums and dads, because you'll need long arms for something you're going to do a bit later. So, uh, who would like... Oh! Volunteer! Give him a round of applause. And your name is Colin. Thank you very much for volunteering, Colin. Can you hold that plate, please? We're going to make a model of a uranium atom using a mouse trap and some ping pong balls. Now, here's another use for Rob's mouse traps. Um, now, I hate setting mouse traps, Colin. It's so easy to catch your fingers. So I'll bend the spring over. Tuck it into the cheese trigger. I've done that. Can I get my fingers out of the way? One hand safe. Second hand safe. Now, Colin, I'll take a ping pong ball with blue tack on it. I'll see if I can balance that on the spring of the mouse trap by squeezing down gently, slowly easing my finger out of the way. Then I'll do the same thing on the other side. Now, some people are probably saying to themselves, wait a minute, Dean, do you mean that uranium atoms look like mouse traps? No, but they act like mouse traps. See, when you set a mousetrap, you store up energy inside. Every atom in the world has energy stored within it. I could make my mousetrap release its energy by putting a piece of cheese on the cheese trigger and waiting for a mouse to come along and touch it. But I don't need to wait for a mouse. I have Colin there. <laughs> He's going to touch the mousetrap for me. Not, not with his finger, but with the third ping pong ball. So hold that just above the cheese trigger, back a little closer. When I say go, drop it, just drop it. Ready, set, go. Uh, practice run. Here we go. Ready, set, go. Oh, look at that. Ping pong balls flying. Now, if you can pass those back and we'll see where they went. One went there. Thanks very much. Imagine what might have happened. I haven't finished yet, Colin. <laughs> what might have happened if we'd had another mouse trap there and one back there? Colin might have hit them both. And if he had, we would have had another one, two, three, four ping pong balls flying through the air. If there'd be more mouse traps in the room, before long, we could have had a chain reaction, which is what happens in the nuclear power station when millions of atoms release their energy. Colin, come around behind the table, please. Now, can you uh, count the mouse traps I have set up in the box there? I crowd as many in as I could. Seven mouse traps, 14 ping pong balls. Question If Colin's going to set up a chain reaction with seven mouse traps, does he need to throw in seven ping pong balls? How many? One should do it. There, that's yours, Colin. Come a little closer. We'll give him a countdown from five. When we get to zero, I'll open the lid. You'll throw the ball in quickly. And I'll close the lid very quickly. If he hits one mouse trap, he may start a chain reaction. Wait for zero, then just toss it in. Countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Oh. <laughs> it landed between the mouse traps. Should we make him reach in and get it out? Yeah. No, we'll give him another ping pong ball. A little harder this time, Colin. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> he got the lot, give him a round of applause. Uh, Colin, don't get too comfortable. I have something else for you to do in a little moment. Okay. Now, on, on uh, Curiosity Show, we decided to do it with a bigger box and it's a glass aquarium. Let's have a look at the, uh, at the uh, uh, aquarium with the Nuclear reaction. Good. About to go in. See them with my little bit of the German version. We have a countdown. Mach die auf mit von 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Licht 19, so ein Millionen Uranatome setzen jeweils ihre Energie frei. Eine gewaltige Kettenreaktion. Rob. Hey, Machine with, with a couple of rollers there, yeah. 
I want you to put the, the paper in between those rollers while I start the one. Right in the middle, nice and square. Okay, now I'm grinding that in. Okay, that's going into the rollers. Now hands off. Okay, what's going to come? When it comes through. <laughs> to buy one of our DVDs. <laughs> we're, selling, we're selling these out there. And they've got segments. I think this one's got the, uh, this one's got the Ames window and the uh, moving picture machine on it. The other one's got the mouse trap race, etc. So that is now yours. <laughs> and uh, we've got one more demonstration which Colin's going to help me again with. So come on out here, Colin. When I was about 10 years old, Colin, I went along to see a magician at a theatre and he did some amazing things and he said that everything he did was magic. Well, I thought about it later and I realised it was all science. He just wasn't explaining what was going on behind the scenes. But the thing I remember best was a tablecloth set up, a table set up like this. Red and white tablecloth, bowl of apples, cup and saucer, bars of flowers. The magician grabbed hold of the tablecloth and pulled it. The tablecloth came away and everything else stayed there. Shall we get Colin to try this? Yeah. Okay, we'll have a practice run first. Can you come around this side, Colin, for the practice run? And just hold the apples for me, please. I'll take the uh, flowers and the cup and saucer out of the way. Colin, when it's your turn, you'll stand on this side of the table, feet half a metre apart. You'll get yourself nicely balanced like this. Then with your right hand, you'll grip the corner of the tablecloth and I'll say, ready, set, go! I want you to pull this hard and fast as I do then, making sure that you keep that tablecloth level with the top of the table and using plenty of follow through like a backhand in tennis. Okay? It's practice time, Colin. I'll take the apples. You take up your position there. Feet half a metre apart, hands out sideways, that's important. Get yourself balanced. Ready, set, go! Give him a clap, well done. Now for the real thing. Tablecloth is going back in position, and some of you remembered your uh, high school physics, and you realise this is just a demonstration of something called inertia. Anything that has weight or mass has something called inertia, which means it'll tend to stay where it is as long as you do everything else very quickly. So you can balance it on your elbow and catch it if you're quick. So that's the idea that we have here. Now, Colin, it's for real this time, so that's going there. You're going in position there, feet half a metre apart. Now, what else did it have on it? Oh, cup and saucer, that's right. Now, they're made of breakable glass. Are you sure you want me to put those on there? Yeah. Should we fill the cup with water? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Let's make it tricky for him. So we'll fill it with water like this. And we'll put it near the front so you can keep your eye on it. Okay, here we go, over there. And Colin's in position. Hands out sideways, check your balance. Did I forget something? Yeah. Oh, the bars of flour, should we put that on there too? <laughs> yes, that's in position too. Colin, take up your position, grip the tablecloth, wait for the signal, ready, set. How are you feeling, Colin? <laughs> A bit nervous. Now underneath the nerves, is there a quiet, calm confidence in science? Yes. Yes, Always. okay. You're going to remember it, whatever happens. Ready, <laughs> set, go! <laughs> the other DVD that we have, and uh, as Rob said, special price today, they're only $20 each. If you get two together, special, special price, $35. Come and see us at our booth if you're interested in the DVDs. Round of applause for Colin. <laughs> Some people say to us, did things always work out the way you wanted to on the Curiosity Factor? Not always, we have a few bloopers to share with you now. Watch this. Here are the things that gave us a surprise as well as you a surprise home watching it. The bloopers. Let's see if we can take out that bottom coin by hitting it with the back of a knife. <laughs> It's not penetrating, it's actually bouncing off the surface.
What happens though, if the pin comes directly down from above, with the same force? <laughs> a cardboard box is a very good structure for absorbing energy. In fact, if I take a heavy weight like this, I can drop that on the cardboard box and let's see what happens. <laughs> of animals that really does that with armour um, plate. And here's a good specimen we've got in the water hole. The yabby. Now that's a very splendid creature, the yabby. If I flick that claw, it's extremely hard. It feels like stone. And in fact, it's got salts in it that are very much like limestone. And that's, of course, is what gives it its protection. But you see, as that grows, it's going to be in trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're, we're going to finish now, but uh, we hope you have a direct day and you've enjoyed some of that. And really, you know, making is absolutely the essence. What you, what you learn, kids, from making is not only the fun of whatever you make, but you learn so much what you can do with your fingers, what you can do with your hands. So get out there, make and do, and uh, have a good day. Have fun the rest of your life.